Hi everyone, I'm Kaylin Chiarello Ebner, editor of Whole Foods Magazine. Thank you so much for joining us for today's presentation, Under the Microscope, A New Understanding of Probiotics, sponsored by Thrive Probiotic, the manufacturer of Just Thrive Probiotic. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. We'd love to get your questions and comments during the presentation, and our panelists will try to answer as many as time allows at the end of the webinar. To ask a question, all you have to do is type your comments in this panel right here, where it hits where you see questions, and then hit the send button. If this panel somehow disappears during the presentation, just click this orange arrow right here and it will pop up again. If you miss anything during the presentation, we'll email you a recorded copy for you to listen to or to share with others. And it's going to be available by Monday on our website, wholefoodsmagazine.com. So let me tell you a little about the presenters. Karan Krishnan is a microbiologist who has been involved in the dietary supplement and nutrition market for the past 15 years. He has spent many of those years studying the strains used in Just Thrive Probiotic. He started in this industry with Amano Enzyme USA, where he launched several dietary supplement ingredients. Kron also designed and conducted over 10 clinical trials as a partner in the contract research organization called LiveSmart Inc. Then we'll hear from Dr. Tom Bain, who is a chiropractic physician and he specializes in nutritional therapies, and he is an international expert in digestive health and detoxification. Dr. Tom has over 20 years of experience in natural health and medicine, including serving as the international marketing director for one of Europe's leading food supplement manufacturers. Dr. Tom has developed over 35 products that are sold directly to physicians. Dr. Tom's 20 years of clinical experience, combined with his extensive knowledge in product development, has led to the development of Just Thrive Probiotic. And last, we'll hear from Tina Anderson, co-founder of Thrive Probiotic. We'll learn a little about her backstory, the founding of Thrive Probiotic, and how the supplement is selling in stores. And listen up, because she's also offering a webinar special for the listeners of this presentation. So be sure to wait for those details about the special offer at the end. Now remember to ask your questions and answers in the questions panel, and we'll get to them during our Q&A. And now I'm going to turn our presentation over to Karan, and you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, Kayleen. This is uh, Karan Krishnan. Thank you all for this opportunity to speak to you about the Just Thrive probiotic and then the new science really behind how we view a, second, uh, a secondary alternative to how probiotic therapy can work. Just Thrive uh, probiotic is, is a new approach to probiotic therapy that really we feel is better supported by the new understanding that we get on gut health and the microbiome and how it's uh, the form and function of the gut health and microbiome uh, based on, on the Human Microbiome Project. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in and uh, move through the presentation so we can cover the, the, uh, the history and the background here. Uh, to start, the history behind probiotics was first discovered in the early 1900s by a Russian scientist named Dmitry Mechnikov. He really was the first guy that put forth this idea that there are bad bacteria within the gut that cause what he called auto-intoxication. So bad digestion was a root cause of many diseases. And he also believed that you could supplement uh, with good bacteria to actually overcome this auto-intoxication. Uh, the bacteria he was using was a Bulgarian bacillus, is what, she, what he called it. It was from fermented milk, and he used it uh, quite successfully from a clinical standpoint. He actually won the Nobel Prize for his work uh, in the early 1900s. The word, of course, probiotic means for life, which was coined in the 1960s, and since then has been basically used to reference any strain of, of uh, bacteria that provides some sort of health benefit. Most probiotics in the market are claimed to help with digestive discomfort and immune support, but when you look at a highly effective probiotic that can actually change some of the dysbiosis within the gut, we think that probiotics can actually expand in terms of what they're used for from a therapeutic standpoint. 
Now, the current market size, it's one of the fastest growing segments of the dietary supplement industry. Most estimates that we've seen, the market is growing from about 22% every year, uh, reaching about a billion dollars this year, estimated to be about one and a half billion in 2016, and this is uh, in capsule and tablet form, not including the large food component of, of probiotics. Uh, when you include the food component, we're talking more around 30 billion. Uh, the opportunity here is to capture somewhere around 140 million in new probiotic sales every single year. And uh, what we are looking at doing is kind of creating a product and positioning a new approach to probiotic therapy that will help uh, some of the stores and some of the more innovative movers uh, to capture some of this incoming market. Uh, majority of probiotic supplements are sold in retail, of course, and these are the, some of the most well-known brands in the marketplace today. Most of the probiotic brands in the marketplace are made up of lactobacillus and bifidobacter species. And so what we're going to be talking about today is an alternative view or secondary view, if you will, of what else can be useful as a probiotic and why. So the current new understanding of the microbiota really comes from the Human Microbiome Project. And what is the Human Microbiome Project? Well, it's a, it's a project, it's a consortium project that was launched and headed up by the NIH approximately five years ago. And the idea was to study the microbiome. Uh, and the microbiome is defined as the totality of microbes, all their genetic elements, and the environmental intra uh, interactions in a defined environment, which happens to be the human body. So why did they do the Human Microbiome Project? Earlier I mentioned the probiotics were discovered in the early 1900s, over 100 years ago. So why this study now? Well, really it's because the human flora has never really been completely characterized. Limitations of typical microbiological techniques don't allow us to really quantify the bacteria that grow within the gut very well. Most of the bacteria that grow within the gut are obligate uh, anaerobes, so oxygen tends to be toxic to them. So when you pull out samples of bacteria from the gut to really quantify and assess what is growing within that particular space, if you're using a plating method, you're going to lose most of the species because plating methods require live bacteria. With the development of metagenomics, which was really perfected through the Human uh, Genome Project, we can use something called a 16S ribosomal RNA fingerprint, which is a, um, a highly conserved region of the genetics of each bacteria that identifies them uh, as to the species and subspecies that they are, and then it can be used to quantify the number of bacteria within a particular sample as well. So the bacteria can be dead. They don't have to be alive. You can pull samples from all different parts of the GI and analyze it using this metagenomics technique, and you can very accurately quantify who lives there and in what amount. Uh, and that has really given the researchers the ability to truly study and understand how the gut is structured and what the microbial community is like. Uh, this has actually allowed for the complete characterization of hundreds of GIs from hundreds of different types of patients. And then they can relate the, the characteristic morphology or the characteristic microbiota uh, to particular diseases and conditions so they can really understand how the gut flora affects uh, health and wellness overall. As I mentioned, it was launched by the NIH about five years ago. It involves over 200 researchers, 80 different research institutes, and a lot of papers and data are coming out of it. So there are people that are spending a lot of their time just kind of interpreting and understanding the data that's coming out of the Human Biome, Microbiome Project, and there's several universities that are taking the lead on that. So here are some new things that we've learned from the Human Microbiome Project. Number one, that we are more bacteria than we're human. I think many people have heard this in the last couple of years. There are 10 trillion human cells that make up the entire human body. There are 100 trillion bacteria cells that, that live in and on us. So we're roughly 10 times more bacteria than we're human from that perspective. There are over 1,000 different species of commensal organisms that live within the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, and in fact, some estimates go as high as 1,500 species, but that's out of 35,000 possible species. So everybody's got a unique distribution of 1,000 to 1,500 species out of 35,000 possible species that live within the gastrointestinal tract. That is far more diverse and, and far more number of species than ever is estimated. Bacterial genes outnumber human genes about 150 to 1. In fact, in some new estimates, it's even higher than that. You know, as humans, we're very high-order creatures, and we, we think of ourselves very highly. 
we've got 25,000 or so human genes that make up our genome. Compare that to actually a rice plant that has roughly 38,000 genes. So even a plant of rice has uh, more genes than we do. And so one of the one of the conundrums there is that how do we have enough genes to conduct all the complex mechanisms that we do on a daily basis? And a lot of that is being credited to the microbial genes that actually exist within us. No two individuals have the exact same composition, not even identical twins who are born of the same mother. Typically on the large phylum level, things are fairly conserved, but when you get down to the species level, there's vast differences in the types of organisms that inhabit each one of our bodies. So we each have our own unique fingerprint of microbiota within our GI, and that is something very important to keep in mind as well. Disease is associated with disruption of gut ecology. Now, diseases like Crohn's, IBS, asthma, obesity, even most recently depression, uh, anxiety, have all been tied to a certain type of disruption within the gut uh, ecology. And uh, those fingerprints seem to be become more and more clear each single day. Pathogenic organisms are normal inhabitants of the gut, things like H. pylori, Staphylococcus, E. coli, things that typically scare doctors, scare people. Uh, these are natural inhabitants of the gut. And in fact, they perform very interesting functions within the gut. Um, it's just that when they're allowed to get overgrown and they're not controlled by the rest of the bacteria within the gut, or the immune system is down and they're allowed to overgrow, they can become problematic. But systematic targeting of these pathogens can cause issues. There's great uh, information that's been done with H. pylori to show that the systematic antibiotic targeting of H. pylori has increased the uh, prevalence rate of, um, of various types of esophageal cancers. So less uh, H. pylori leads to increased types of different types of cancers. Um, and there's a direct correlation there between the presence of a pathogen and an important outcome. So something to keep in mind as well. The intestinal microbiota is not homogenous. So we used to think of the intestines as a big fermentation organ with a lot of bacteria and a lot of food going through that um, and a lot of uh, just nonspecific fermentation and nonspecific um, segmentation as far as the microbial community. But what we tend to find is if you look at the spatial and temporal aspects of the intestinal microbiota, Within each tissue segment, the population can be quite a bit different. And in many cases, there isn't a lot of crossover. So if you look at uh, the left side of your screen, uh, starting with uh, section A, uh, looking at the stomach and moving proximal uh, all the way down to the distal GI tract, the distal colon, you've got very different types of bacteria that exist within each of those segments and different concentrations as well. Of course, the environment continues to change as well as you go from the stomach all the way down to the distal colon in terms of temperature, pH, uh, and other uh, tissues, uh, the types of tissues that exist within those areas. Even more interesting, if you look at B, if you look at a cross section of the intestine, when you go from the intestinal lumen, you move distal to the lumen all the way to the epithelium surface, even in the cross section, which is just a few millimeters thick, you've got very different types of bacteria that exist in the lumen, in the mucosal layer, and in the epithelium. And there's not that much crossover. So what that indicates is that these species are specialized to exist within one area or a few different areas of particular type of tissue within the gastrointestinal system. And that indicates that there's binding sites. There are binding uh, receptors where these species can attach whereas in other parts of the tissue, they don't have the right receptors or binding sites to attach. So this is a very specialized and organized system, not the way we used to think about it before. So there's 100 trillion microbes in the gut. They're very important. They perform a lot of important functions. Where do we get our gut microbiota from? And that's a very important question. Uh, the first and main place is really through mom. So a lot of the inoculation of the gastric system and that the intestinal system comes from childbirth. Passing through the birth canal, the, the baby, the fetus, gets a huge inoculum from, mother, from mom's uh, vaginal bacteria, which at that point is actually, after the second trimester of being pregnant, is actually going to change more to reflect her gut microbiota. One great example of that is the presence of a bacteria called Lactobacillus johnsi. Lactobacillus johnsi is a bacteria that is um, primarily responsible for digesting milk. So it's not a very high prevalence bacteria in, in the normal vaginal flora. But after the first 
trimester of pregnancy, you start to see a very high prevalence rate of lactobacillus chonsi in the, in the birth canal, in the vaginal microbiota, specifically there now to prepare and inoculate the, the baby as they're passing through the birth canal. Now, after that, after passing through the birth canal, of course, breastfeeding and nursing is very important. There's four to 600 different species of bacteria within breast milk itself. And, and of course, a major nutrient component of breast milk is an oligosaccharide that the baby can't digest for energy or food. It's there specifically to act as a prebiotic to, to establish the microbiota for the baby. So most of your lactobacillus and bifrobacter that you have in your gut, you got from mom through the birthing process, through initial contact with mom, skin to skin. Now, if you look at what happens to a baby's microbial communities right after birth and, and slowly past birth, you see an initial dispersal. So if you inoculate a newborn baby in their mouth, on their skin, or in their gut, all of that bacteria matches mom's vaginal bacteria at that time. Now, there's a period of succession where the bacteria ends up specializing into the different types of tissue. So during that succession, if you inoculate um, a two-and-a-half-year-old or three-year-old, now the mouth bacteria tends to, tends to mimic mom's mouth bacteria. Skin bacteria tends to mimic mom's skin bacteria, and gut bacteria tends to mimic mom's gut bacteria. And so there's that dispersal and then a succession period where the bacteria ends up specializing for each different tissue. Now, about 838 days after birth, you basically have your adult-like microbiota. So this is where the hundreds of trillions of species, that, uh, hundreds of trillions of cells and thousands of species come from. And most of the lactobacillus and bifidobacter you're ever going to have in your life come from this process. The second place is the environment. Of course, after a baby's born, it's crawling around in the ground and the dirt. Most, for most of human existence, we lived as hunters and gatherers. We lived off the land, um, not in the modern communities and sterilized world that we live in right now. And so we got a lot of exposure to outside environmental bacteria. And, uh, and those seem to play an important role as well, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but what we find is that any diversion from this natural process, meaning if you have a C-section birth versus a natural childbirth, or if you're a bottle-fed baby versus a breastfed baby, or if there's antibiotics introduced soon after childbirth or during labor, um, all these kind of diversions from the natural process have now been linked to significantly higher incidence rates of many diseases, things like autoimmunity, uh, other immune dysfunctions like eczema, psoriasis, allergies, um, of course, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, things like that have all been now linked to um, any diversion from this natural process of inoculating the body. So what is really the goal of a healthy microbiome? And at the end of the day, they talked about um, most of the data coming out of the Human Microbiome Project. They said that a diverse microbiome is really the goal here. And why a diverse microbiome? Well, diversity gives you strength. You know, diversity means that you can do more functions. You've got more players within the microbiome that can perform functions. So if you've got one type of bacteria that breaks down oxalates, for example, and you happen to go on a course of antibiotics, and that, that type of bacteria is, has been suppressed, and their growth has been minimized, and something else has taken over. Now you're not breaking down oxalates as, effective, uh, as effectively as you were before, and now you're developing more kidney stones. But if you've got three or four different types of species that break down oxalates within the gut, then you've got functional redundancies and makes your, your, uh, your gut and then, of course, your health better as well. Uh, that's the functional redundancies. The diverse communities are much more resistant to invasion. And um, the harder it is, or sorry, the more diverse your gut is, the harder it is for invading species from the outside to take over. So parasites and viruses and fungus and things like that. So diversity gives the microbiome strength. And that seems to be the overall theme in understanding what is making, what consists of a healthy gut. So what affects the microbiome? What affects this diversity? Uh, age does. So one of the things they found is that as people age, the diversity of the microbiome starts to shrink. Uh, and of course, as we know, reduced diversity brings more and more health and, and ailments, uh, health issues and ailments. And so that could be one of the functions of aging itself is the microbial community is turning down the clock. So it's a very interesting connection there that the microbial community themselves are kind of turning down your biological clock in a way through the diversity and, and health and functionality of the gut itself. 
Uh, diet is a major factor. What you eat really matters in terms of um, your microbial community. If you eat very particular types of foods all the time, less, less diversity in foods, a lot of processed foods, a lot of refined sugars, those tend to select for very specific types of bacteria. So you actually end up increasing an overgrowth of those types of bacteria and suppressing the growth of the other species. And so you lose diversity there. Antibiotic use, of course, uh, early on in life and, of course, even through adulthood can bring down the diversity in the, in the uh, microbiome and allow for certain strains to take over more space in real estate than they should. Physiology, there are some physiological defects and differences in people's guts that can actually um, lead to lack of diversity, uh, lack of ability for certain types of species to grow. And, um, you know, SIBO is a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is one such conditions where there are some physiological changes in people that actually um, create a different environment in the small intestines that allows for the overgrowth of a particular type of bacteria. Genetics, and genetics is very loose. You know, we always thought that genes really controlled everything. What we find is that of all the other factors, genetics is, has the loose, loosest amount of control on what happens in our gut microbiome. You can affect the microbiome with many other factors. Genetics, your genetics, the genes that are passed down from your parents have less control over what is actually happening in your gut than one would actually think. So what are the strategies for probiotic supplementation? Now we have this kind of a, a reviewed, a, a evolved understanding of the gut, um, where the bacteria comes from, what makes the gut healthy, what are the strategies for probiotic supplementation? Now there's two places, of course, we mentioned that you get bacteria from, from mom and, and from the environment. Uh, and the goal, of course, is a very diverse microbiome. Now, most of the products on the market today, the current strategy, I, I call it a reseeding strategy. Uh, we get all our lactobacillus and bifidobacter species that live within our gut currently from mom. So the idea now is we're reseeding that population with outside grown lactobacillus and bifidobacter species. That's why a majority of products on the marketplace are made up of lactobacillus and bifidobacter. So the idea is every day you put back some, uh, uh, some amount of good bacteria and eventually the good will outweigh the bad and you're you're creating a more positive microbiome. Um, here are some products, you know, very common uh, retail products that are found. This is a typical product with 15 to 20 different strains, anywhere from 50, 100, 200 billion CFUs, and this is just what some of the current solutions are on the marketplace. Um, so let's talk about the reseeding plan and what we feel are some difficulties with it. First of all, there's survival issues. So we'll talk about each of these in, in more detail in the upcoming slides. Second, there's a fitness issue. Third, is it natural? Does it make sense as a strategy based on our new understanding of the gut and how it's structured? And three, quality. And there's some quality issues to talk about as well. So first, let's talk about survivability. For a bacteria, in order for it to reseed your gut, if you will, it has to be able to get through the gastric system and get into the intestines alive where they can colonize the intestinal um, tract. Now, that, that would be a very necessary function of a reseeding type of bacteria. But lactobacillus and bifidobacter species are not typically species that are very resistant to acid. There are some forms of them that are a little bit more resistant than others. But from a, from a consumption standpoint, they don't do great through the gastric barrier, uh, which is, of course, the stomach. So we looked at some of the studies that are available looking at the survivability of typical lactobacillus and bifidobacter species through the gastric system. This is one such study. This was done by the Food Standard Agency, which is kind of an FDA uh, within the UK in col collaboration with Reading University. Basically what they did is they took 35 strains from very popular commercial products, uh, primarily lactobacillus and bifidobacter species, and they evaluated them for survivability of these common products through the gastric system. Uh, the first step is they took the species and they put them through survival of gastric juices which was 20 minutes at a pH of 1 to 3. And 20 minutes is actually not the USB standard. The USB standard is 2 hours, so this is much lower than the USB standard. At a pH of 1, they didn't find any survivors at all. And a pH of 1 is not an unusual pH for the, for the stomach. Between pH 2 and 3, of the 35, they found 18 were, were, were able to get through and survive the gastric system. And, but the ones that did survive had about half the count that they normally did. So they have about 50% of their original numbers. But they took the survivors then, and then they put them through upper GI bile acid tolerance tests. And so 
looking at them moving through the gastric system, the next step, they would have come in contact with bile acid tolerance in the upper GI. Of the 18 tested, only six showed any viability in the presence of bile acid salts and would thus have any chance of making it through the intestines at all. So now we're down to six out of the original 35. Remember, these six have already lost about half their numbers. Now, they took the six and they put them through uh, lower GI conditions to see if those six had the capability of getting to the lower GI where we want colonization to happen. And of those six strains, only four showed any viability in the lower intestinal tract at all. So at the end of the day, what we have here is four out of 35 strains would have been able to get to the site of action, the site of colonization, but would typically have about 50% of their numbers to begin with. So um, not great survivors through the normal gastric system. We did our own type of study uh, where we commissioned Silica Labs out of Chicago to actually do a similar test on common products that are found in the marketplace and looking at their survivability through the gastric system because, again, that is step one in order for a reseeding bacteria to get to into the gut, gut uh, and, and proliferate. So there were four products tested, a leading retail brand, uh, a leading yogurt, a uh, leading Greek yogurt, and then the Just Thrive product. Now, the way the study is designed is the, brand, the brands were purchased by the lab themselves. So the lab went out to the stores and did that. It's a third-party lab. We did not send in the products um, so that it, it, the, you know, we've got a hands-off approach to it. Basically, what we're looking at is USP, U.S. Pharmacopoeia, simulated gastric solution, which is a pH of 1.3 for two hours, and then some bile salt tolerance to it as well. Now, the data we'll show is based on percent survival of the bacterial population. And of course, we have a leading retail probiotic brand. Uh, we've got uh, a leading Greek yogurt, a standard yogurt, and then just Thrive. And here's what the data looks like. So on all of the products, you saw virtual decimation of, of the bacteria. Uh, very, very difficult to actually pick up any detectable uh, bacteria at all. The leading probiotic brand had roughly 250 billion cells to begin with, uh, was well below that level. Virtually 99.9999% of it was, uh, was killed by the stomach acid. Uh, the various yogurts had anywhere from 15 to 20 million, upwards of 200 million um, cells. And, uh, and in fact, I think one of them had a little bit higher than that. And of course, they had virtually undetectable levels of bacteria, live bacteria at that point as well. Uh, just Thrive survived, uh, not 100%, you can never say 100% microbiology, it's 99.9% survival through that with no measurable attrition at all. So survival through the gastric solution, uh, this is an is a interesting test of some of the most common products out there. The other issues for fitness. Um, we're talking about an anaerobic environment where we want the bacteria to colonize in the lower GI is typically a very anaerobic environment in the gut. So there's no oxygen there, and most of the bacteria there don't like oxygen. Now, when we're growing up these species in, in factories in the outside world, we're growing them up in aerobic situations. So these are effectively now becoming aerobic species. So can we reseed an anaerobic environment with an aerobic species, especially when that aerobic species is entering an environment with hundreds of trillions of competitors that are very supremely adapted to exist within that environment. And I always give the analogy, it's like planting fish in your garden. You know, they don't breathe the same air. And so that's a very that's a difficult problem to overcome. Uh, the second part is can they evade immune destruction? You know, a lot of these species are have changed from their original wild type isolates that came out of the gut maybe, um, you know, a while ago, a decade ago, two decades ago. Um, and now they've been grown in several cycles in the outside world within a high oxygen-rich environment. And so are they the same species that existed in the gut originally? And if they're not, can they, detect, can they evade immune destruction? Um, there's some unclear, uh, unclear thoughts on that as well. Do they fit in your gut? So are there binding sites? You know, we understand now that the gut is a very ordered organ. Not every bacteria can actually fit in there and bind and colonize. It's a very specialized system. And so do they contain the binding sites anymore uh, for actually colonizing to the intestinal cells? There are some studies that looked at this. Here's one study published in 2007. They look at the adhesion abilities of 11 strains of lactobacillus. These are very popular uh, lactobacillus strains that are used in many probiotic products. And they looked at a cell tissue culture model. Now, a tissue culture model is an ideal model for cell binding because 
you're the only bacteria there, you're given all the nutrients and all the conditions to bind, and you're given a very nice clean epithelium layer to actually bind uh, within the within the, a control lab environment. So the results showed that there were the best adhesion rate was 38 uh, percent from one of the bacteria. From there, the second best was 24 percent, the rest went down pretty fast. So even under optimal condition, the binding ability of most of these products, uh, most of these strains that are used in products, ha are very low. So can if they can even get to the intestinal uh, tract, can they actually bind? That's another question that one has to keep in mind. Number two, is it natural? So does it happen in nature? When you look at a product that has 200 billion CFUs of various lactobacillus and bifidobacter species, um, my, my contention has always been, well, where does that happen in nature? Where did our ancestors get 200 billion uh, CFUs of uh, various lactobacillus and bifidobacter species, and what you find is you don't really see that in nature. You know, the, it's not common for this type of lactobacillus distribution and, and bifidobacter species to exist naturally in nature in those concentrations. So it's not quite a natural thing to be consuming them in such high volume. The second part is, you know, looking at diversity. Again, we, we mentioned that a uh, diverse microbiome is a healthy microbiome. So if we're looking at diversity and we want to increase the number of species that grow within the GI, does it make sense to load the gut with the same 15, 20 strains every day on a daily basis, all their genetic elements, all their cell wall components, um, or is there another approach to increasing the diversity within the GI? So that's something else to keep in mind. Uh, is it really natural way of doing it? Quality. Uh, there are some strains uh, used in products that, that studies show that have benefits, but there are certainly a lot of strains that are used in products that studies show don't really do anything. Uh, and then also mislabeling of probiotic strains has been found to be an issue as well. So there are a number of studies, there's been some European um, regulatory panels that have done large-scale studies to look at the, the prevalence of mislabeling of strains within these multi-strain cocktail products. Um, and one such EU expert panel showed and finalized that products that they tested in large part were incorrect, incorrectly labeled with the wrong strains. So you've got these multi-strain cocktails. Um, many of these strains are very similar to each other. The differences are min minuscule. Uh, is anyone actually checking each one of those and making sure that when you have a finished product, you have 20 strains in there, are each of those 20 strains present, nothing else? Um, and, and what quantities. And so that's a very important question as well. Products contain much more reduced numbers of strains than are initially claimed, and a lot of that is because the attrition rate through processing, through storage and stability. You know, a lot of products are, are said to be refrigerated in order to keep them stable, but then are they manufactured in a ref refrigerated condition? Are they stored and transported under refrigerated conditions? They might get to the store and be put in the refrigerator, but they might have spent a month outside of the refrigerator during processing. So uh, they tend to have much lower numbers than what you actually find on the label. And they even found the presence of strains not on the label itself. In some cases, they found pathogenic strains. And this is a large regulatory report that was put out on some of the most commonly used products out in the marketplace. And there's at least three other published papers that looked at um, rampant mislabeling within multi-strain cocktail probiotics. So it becomes important to understand, like, do we actually, uh, are we, do we actually know what we're taking? Do we actually know what's in the product? Are the companies actually uh, delineating each single strain and characterizing them properly? And what you tend to find is, is that has to, that that can be a problem in the marketplace. So the reseeding plan. You know, we've got several issues. Survival. Studies show that these strains aren't typically great at surviving through the gastric system, but let's say they do survive and they get to the intestines. Do they have the fitness? Does it make sense for an aerobic strain living in or grown in an oxygen-rich environment to be able to colonize an anaerobic environment? But let's say they do uh, breathe the same air and they can colonize. Well, then you have to question, is it natural? Does it make sense as a strategy? Uh, does it happen anywhere in nature, number one? Number two? Uh, from, a, from a strategy standpoint of increasing diversity, does that actually make sense? And then the last part that cannot be ignored is the quality. You know, do you, how much assurance do you have that those 15, 20 strains, 30 strains that are in the product are actually in there and nothing else? And what kind of testing has been done to characterize each and every strain uh, and it, with their presence or absence within a product? And so studies have shown that it is a problem, so it's something to think about. 
So we think that the reseeding strategy has some flaws with it, has some problems with it. There are certainly products within this category that, that have some beneficial effects, uh, but the strategy as a whole may not make that much sense, especially with our new understanding of how the gut functions. So the other place that we can look at is going back to the basics. You know, after we're born and we're, our guts are seeded, inoculated, we are exposed to the environment the rest of our lives. And the environment contains a whole host of bacteria, most of which don't do anything from a probiotic standpoint, um, but some do. And that, that's really where we've kind of focused our work on. Uh, let's look first at the importance of environmental bacteria. Does adequate exposure to environmental bacteria really make any difference? Uh, the first part was we looked at studies uh, that compared children and people that lived in a rural area versus an urban area. This first one was looking at healthy children from Bangladesh versus the United States, looking at the diversity of the gut microbiome, which means the health of the gut microbiome. And what they found that the distal gut of Bangladeshi children harbored significantly greater bacterial diversity than that of U.S. children. And in fact, they included novel lineages of strains that weren't even found in the U.S. kids. So Bangladeshi rural children live in a very um, direct contact with the earth type of atmosphere. And so they get a lot of exposure to dirt and things like that natural environment. So that's a, that's a factor in changing. But again, one thing you can, you can point out is these are two different types of people, different diets different heritages, different ethnicities, so maybe we should look at something that, uh, that is bring, brings it home a little bit closer. So here's another study that was published, uh, I think, just in 2013. They looked at the human gut microbiota community in urban and rural populations in Russia itself. So now we've got the same race of people, very similar diets, and looking at the differences between the urban and rural people. What they found was they called it the original microbial community. Uh, which is the, the original community of microbes that, that should be within our gut. Uh, these structures occurred in hosts from urban populations 2.6 fold less than in rural populations. So rural populations had two and a half times higher prevalence rate of the original microbial community, which implies that the rural population's micro microbiota was a healthy original microbiota. So it makes a difference to be closer to the earth and living and, and getting exposure to the environment. Another one looked at the fecal microflora of elderly persons in rural and urban Japan. Uh, this one was published actually in 1989, uh, but they found a significant rural-urban disparity in microbial composition. Uh, rural populations tend to have higher bifidobacter levels, for example. Uh, bifidobacter levels, of course, very important for the uh, function of the colon in itself. So importance in uh, exposure to the environment is, seems to be key. Another great example of studies very recently done on the Hazard tribe of Tanzania. They, they are some of the late, last and latest hunter-gatherer people on Earth. They live a very ancient ancestral life. Their environment hasn't been changed for thousands of years. And of course, they don't have any of the modern amenities that, uh, that most people do. Um, they have massive exposure to ancestral micro, microbial communities because they live on the dirt, they cook on the dirt, they eat in the dirt, everything happens in the ground on the dirt. They dig for roots and tubers like our ancestors did, so they've got massive exposure to the ancestral microbial community. And what they found is they tend to have vastly different microbiota compared to westernized populations, and virtually no digestive, common digestive disorders, things like Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, colon cancer, reflux, and so on and so forth. They've got a very different and healthy microbiome uh, than, than the Western population does. So um, looking then at bacteria within the environment that actually can act as a probiotic. So we didn't want to take the approach of just getting a bunch of soil organisms and, and, and dirt and, and using that therapeutically. We wanted to hone in and figure out, well, what is it within the environment that actually has efficacy and the features to be a probiotic? And what are these required features? So number one, they have to be able to naturally survive the harsh gastric environment. Uh, number two, they have to be a strain found in the microbiota, so it actually has the ability to bind and colonize. So it's a unique strain that has to be able to live in the outside environment, in the dirt, and then also in the gut and have a binding site for it in the gut. They must have evolutionary significance. We must be able to show that humans were exposed to these particular types of bacteria throughout most of human evolution. And they must be facultative anaerobes, so they must be able to live in an oxygen-rich environment outside of the body and in a no-oxygen environment in the gut. And so that's a very special um, ability of a bacteria to do that. They must have a biphasic life cycle, so they must have a life cycle in the gut and, in, and outside of the body as well so that they can conduct their life form both in these two different, drastically different environments. 
They must have clinical demonstration of safety and efficacy as well. Um, just taking strains uh, that are that are present in the in the soil uh, without a long history of use and all that and proper characterization. We didn't think it was the right approach, so we wanted to focus on strains that actually had a lot of clinical and, and history of use backing behind it as well. So what is nature's design for supplemental probiotics that meets all those very unique criteria? We found them to be bacterial spores, and in particular, bacillus spores. They're the most widely studied and most widely used probiotics outside of the supplement industry. In fact, bacillus spores were the first commercialized probiotics back in the 1950s in the prescription format, and, and at least one of those are still present in the market today. Andro Germina is a uh, prescription form of bacillus spores that, have, that is marketed by Sanofi Aventis in South America and Asia, in, uh, in Europe as well, uh, and used for a variety of treatments. Bacti Subtil is another one that's been in, that had been in the market for some time. I'm not sure where in the market it still is, but there's a number of prescription products all over the world that utilize these in hospitals and clinics every single day. Uh, they're also used extensively in agriculture and aquaculture because they have a very interesting feature that they tend to be universal probiotics. They tend to colonize the guts of almost every animal you can think of, insects and mammals, uh, birds and reptiles. You'll find these bacillus species within the guts of each of these types of animals as well. They're the most widely used and well studied in humans. Uh, and these are the five strains that, that are, uh, sorry, the, uh, the the four strains that are very widely understood, Bacillus subtilis, coagulants, clausi, and then we're also introducing a new one called Bacillus indicus, HE36. Key features of spores that make them great probiotics, they form robust endospores, they can withstand harsh temperatures when the moment they're outside of the body in their non-natural state, um, they, they are very resistant to harsh acids and UV radiation, desiccation, so it makes them very stable in the environment and then very stable passing through the gastric system naturally. They're found all over the environment, as I mentioned before. They can remain dormant for up to 50 million years. There are some reports of spores uh, being dormant and, and extracted out of fossilized ancient insects that are 250 million years old. So they've been around for a long time, and uh, their genetics haven't changed very much. They colonize very effectively in the, in the gut. And they're found as part of the normal human commensal organism species, too. So they're not necessarily soil-based organisms because they don't live in the soil. They live in the gut, and they use the soil as a vector to transfer from host to host. Very long history of use, and are extremely safe. Um, they're used, uh, their use as a probiotic is supported by evolution because humans have been exposed to them for millions of years. Every time our ancestors ate off the land, drank waters from a stream, they got a huge inoculum of these particular types of species and they've developed a commensal uh, symbiotic relationship with the human gut. This is what an endospore looks like. It's got a, a protein a core which contains its DNA, a very thick protein coat. It's metabolically inactive in the spore form. It's got little sensors that stick out of it to measure its environment. When it gets into a favorable environment, it actually comes out of the spore form within a matter of minutes, and it becomes a live vegetative cell. So then what we were looking for is are there any effective spore-based probiotics in the market today? Uh, and no, we didn't find any until now in introducing Just Thrive. Uh, Just Thrive is what, we, uh, what we've created to be able to introduce a very effective spore-based probiotic into the market. And I'll throw it over to Dr. Tom Bain to talk a little bit more about the strains and uh, the clinical significance of the product. Thank you, Karan. I'm going to be talking about the strains in Just Thrive um, and some of their clinical, uh, the clinical experience I've had using these strains with certain conditions. So, so Just Thrive is a complete probiotic. It was developed under the advisement of spore expert Dr. Simon Cutting, uh, and it was created specifically for the retail market. Um, we're utilizing verified, branded, and registered strains. Uh, this is key. So we, uh, Dr. Cutting runs a bacterial bank in, in London, and, and he uh, makes sure that we're getting exactly what we're ordering. So when we uh, are looking at these different strains, we're not getting any contamination or any problems. And then we grow those bacteria up and, uh, and, and then put them in capsules for, for sale. So, so we're containing four different bacillus spore probiotics in, in a group. And so they, they're, they're, they're in a consortium as they appear in the environment. So in the environment, you don't just find one strain. They work together, and they, have, and they function as a group. Um, we're producing all our strains in a uh, certified GMP facility under drug manufacturing guidelines. 
Um, we're guaranteed prescription grade. We're licensed from Royal Holloway London University. So we're delivering 3 billion live probiotic sales. So this is cells. This is a, a dose that matches and exceeds all prescription products of the same strength. So it's the single most powerful spore probiotic formulation. Um, it's blended with a prebiotic to, that enhances colonization. And it's guaranteed 100% spore format. Um, this is a key feature. Um, and, and what we're going to show, too, here is that this is the first probiotic that's ever uh, been shown to actually produce carotenoids uh, in the digestive tract. So one of the strains in Just Thrive will actually get past the digestive system. And when it gets on the other side, it will start to eat fibers and, and sugars. And it will make, as waste products, uh, alpha carotene, beta carotene, zeaxanthin, astaxanthin, lycopene, and lutein. It's making these carotenoids in, um, at RDA levels right at the site of absorption. So very exciting finding a new, new idea, new concept in, uh, in probiotics. And so the functions of spores in Just Thrive is uh, colonization. So you've got numerous studies that show a long history of use that have confirmed survivability and, throughout, and, and that the spores uh, work throughout the gastrointestinal tract. So studies have shown that they're well adapted to germinate in the small intestines, grow and re-proliferate, uh, and resporulate in the lower GI. So they, what, what happens is they actually will go through a process of resporulation and then come back into an active bacteria in our digestive tract. And we don't know exactly why this is, but we do know that it is very important for the development of our immune system in our digestive tract. And so uh, human digestive tract the immune system of the human digestive tract is dependent on exposure to these organisms in order for it to develop. Um, bacillus spores are found in the GI of everything we've seen to date. Insects, animals, marine life, uh, which seems to prove out that it's a, a, a kind of a universal commensal probiotic. Um, studies now indicate that the environment is a vector that the bug uses to move from host to host. So it, it takes about 7 to 21 days for the spores to move through the entire digestive tract. And while they're in there, they're policing the digestive tract, getting rid of infections, and keeping the immune system strong. So microbiota shift and balance. So these spores have shown the ability to shift your natural environment, your natural microbiota, the bacteria that you got from your mom. These spores have actually been able to shift the growth of that bacteria and improve them. Um, so they do this by producing a, a number of antibiotics to get rid of bad bacteria. Um, they also do it through competitive exclusion, where they actually fight for space on the intestinal lining uh, with pathogenic bacteria. Um, they increase the growth of your important commensals, such as lactobacillus. Uh, they do this through the production of short-chain fatty acids um, and really just changing the environment of the intestines, making it uh, more of a happy place for your endogenous bacteria to grow. So our gut model study actually showed a 30% shift in the na natural environment uh, of, the, of the bacteria, your natural environment. So, so exciting to see that, that these bugs go in, make changes to the environment that allow the, the bacteria that you got from your mom to thrive and proliferate. So we're not aware of any other probiotic that's demonstrated the, the, the ability to fix dysbiosis to, to this level. Um, so the function spore is uh, immune modulation. So what you're looking at is uh, part of the intestinal tract. And the intestines have large amounts of, of gut-associated lymphoid tissue, the gall, and the Peyer's patches. And the, and the Peyer's patches and the gall is the immune system of the digestive tract. And, and uh, the spores in Just Thrive are, are able to stimulate these areas, which then has an overall modulating benefit to your overall immune system. So uh, the function of spores. Uh, they help to develop the gall, as I said. They they're increase the circulating T and B lymphocytes. Uh, this is again some action that we see in the Peyer's patches. Um, it shifts the body from a T2 inflammatory state to a T1 adaptive state. Um, we're able to see the spores improve pattern recognition uh, via toll-like receptors. And we're also able to see it shift the innate, from the innate resp immune response to an adaptive immune response. Um, the spores also function as a digestive aid, so they make the full spectrum of digestive enzymes, um, especially high, do high amounts of, uh, of protease enzymes to help with digestion of bacteria. Uh, we discussed the changing of dysbiosis to actually be able to shift the environment from an unfavorable pathogenic environment to a favorable uh, healthy environment. 
Um, and they also help with the direct digestion of resistance, resistant starches, uh, proteins, fats, plant matter, and non-starch non uh, polysaccharides. So uh, it supports a healthy inflammatory response, and so it, it helps the, the, with the assimilation of nutrients. It helps uh, decrease inflammation. Um, with the, the helps with detoxification of elements that are uh, found in our environment. Uh, vomitoxin is something found in wheat that is the spores have shown the ability to digest, break down, and, and help the body get rid of. Uh, but one of the key features of, of the spores is, is the ability to produce nutrients. Um, so this is, a, is something that completely separates the spore formers from all the other bacterial uh, probiotics in the market, is their ability to produce nutrients. So we've been able to identify the production of vitamins, like the menaquinones, the vitamin K2, the full spectrum of B vitamins. Um, they are actually able to digest resistant starches and non-starch polysaccharides in your digestive tract, and that what that does is it causes a, a dramatic increase in short-chain fatty acids. These short-chain fatty acids are key fuel for the cells of your colon, um, and very important for uh, modulating the immune response in in the gut. Uh, they help to help with blood flow and fluid and electrolyte uptake in in the colon. Um, and, and the other thing that's really interesting about short-chain fatty acids is that it actually teaches your body how to burn fat for, for fuel. And so if, you're, if you've got people that where their, their bodies are only burning sugar and they're, and they're storing fat, uh, we're able to make that shift where the body will actually switch from burning sugar for energy to burning fat for energy. Um, and that's a very exciting component of the uh, short-chain fatty acids. Um, and the, the short-chain fatty acids, as I said before, they, they support the growth of the good lactobacillus and bifidobacteria that you got from your mom. Um, the, like I said too earlier, I talked about the HE36. This new bacteria that's been discovered produces high levels of carotenoids, and they're the highest bioavailability of any carotenoid on the market because carotenoids, just like lactobacillus and bifidobacteria probiotics, are very sensitive to the stomach acids and the survivability through the digestive tract. So to have a, a bacteria that's on the other side of your stomach, on the other, in the small intestine, producing carotenoids where they can be absorbed um, is, is an exciting new way to treat oxidative stress uh, in the human body. So why these four strains? So Bacillus subtilis, HE58, is one of the more potent uh, strains in the formula. It's been widely used, safe, highly effective. It produces over 12 different antibiotics. And all the research that we've been able to see with this bacteria is that it is the strongest at fighting infection and, and strengthening the immune, immune response. Uh, it also produces uh, high levels of vitamin K2 uh, in the digestive tract. Bacillus indicus, which I spoke of in, in detail, is the one that produces the carotenoids. Uh, the most effective antioxidants in the marketplace. Bacillus clausi is the most widely used probiotic drug in the world. Um, it supports immune health. It's antibiotic resistant, so it's very good to use with patients that are on antibiotics. Um, and bacillus, bacillus coagulans is the last strain, um, and it's very well studied, long history of use. Produces the uh, L plus optical form of lactic acid, uh, which is very good for, um, for helping restore balance in the digestive tract. It also supports immune health. And uh, so what at this point, I, I, I want to kind of go off track here because I do want to be able to get to some of the clinical experiences that I've had. So I've been using the strains in Just Thrive for uh, about two and a half years, coming up on three years. And uh, I have seen some incredible things uh, with, with a number of, of different types of cases. And so it, it clearly has been, to have these strains at, at, at my clinical disposal has been uh, the greatest benefit to my practice um, because it, they help with so many different things. So overall, I'm helping a lot more people with the, with the same product. And so... Um, Conditions, uh, digestive issues like IBS and Crohn's and colitis patients, uh, that, those patients take up 
between 70 and 80 percent of my practice. And so I, I, I have seen incredible changes with patients with primary digestive issues. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, patients with chronic infections, chronic sinus infections, chronic upper, upper respiratory infections, I've seen incredible immune system changes with those patients that have allowed them to uh, break the cycles of infection and, and stay healthy. Um, I've also seen some really dramatic changes with patients with different types of skin conditions. Eczema and psoriasis have, have responded very favorably. Uh, um, seborrheic dermatitis is another one that I've seen some really interesting case studies uh, lately with some of my patients. And so um, the, the numbers of conditions um, is so much broader using the spores than it is with the with the other lactobacillus and bifidobacteria based products. Um, I, I do want to make one comment. You know, there there are some benefits to lactobacillus and bifidobacteria based probiotics. I've been doing what I do for 20 years. I have used many lactobacillus and bifidobacteria products that are that are in the marketplace. I've probably used all of them over the course of time. Um, there, there are some benefits. The, the, the dead bacteria do seem to change the pH of the intestines, um, and research out of Japan has actually shown that just the DNA of the dead bacteria can create some mild, inconsistent immune stimulation in the digestive tract. So the, the, the question of, well, why do some people see benefits with lactobacillus and bifidobacteria-based products if they aren't surviving? Uh, how can that be? And, and it's, a, it's a simple answer. It's the same reason why some people benefit from yogurts and Greek yogurts. It's actually not the bacteria itself, but it's the ferment. It's the waste products that these bacteria make. And uh, dead bacteria do have the, the ability to make some minor changes to the digestive tract. What you don't see with those bacteria that you do see with the spores, though, is uh, the competitive exclusion with pathogenic organisms and the nutrient production, which we spoke of at the end. So I want to thank you all for your time. I'm going to hand things over to uh, to Tina Anderson, who is the co-founder of, of Just Thrive, and I'll let her take it from here. Great. Thank you, Tom, uh, Dr. Tom. Um, I'm, as Tom said, I'm Tina Anderson. My husband, Bill Anderson, and I are the founders of Just Thrive Probiotic. And we just want to thank you so much for taking the time today to join in on today's webinar. We're so appreciative that you've done this and you've uh, stayed tuned for this uh, great information and good science. Um, just to tell you a little bit about ourselves, Bill and I have been in the pharmaceutical industry for the past 20 years with our company DMS Pharmaceutical Group. And while it's been a good business, you know, we've seen the overuse and overprescribing of pharmaceuticals. and have witnessed firsthand the industry's focus on treatment of symptoms rather than prevention of illness. And this is just not the way we approach health, health with ourselves and our three children. Um, instead, we focus um, on living more natural, a more natural lifestyle by eating real foods and getting plenty of rest and being as active as possible. And the bottom line was we wanted to focus our career on health and the prevention of illness rather than treatment of symptoms is just more in line with who we are and what we believe in, and it's really where our passion is. And so we created DMS Natural Health. Um, we were on a personal journey to improve our own health and wellness, and what we found was how critically important our gut was to our overall health. You know, when we began our journey to find an effective probiotic, we found that many of the probiotics on the market were inadequate. You know, they didn't survive the stomach acid, they weren't colonizing, and they weren't really causing stimulation to our digestive system. And that's really what motivated us to um, be a part of creating our own probiotic with strains that were effective and safe and strains that have been extensively studied and, and that work. And that's how Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant was born. Um, it's been an amazing journey. We love, love this industry and have so enjoyed working every day towards something that has helped our own health and the health of our family and our friends and all of our new customers. And, I have also thoroughly enjoyed working with and meeting health food store owners. So many of you have such passion yourselves, and you all have so much knowledge. It's been really incredible to see. Um, stores that have started carrying Thrive have had great success with Thrive. Um, as you can see, Dave from Crystal Lake Health Food Store said, Just Thrive is no longer the top-selling probiotic in our store. It's now the top-selling product in our store. You know, it's important to mention that Dave has only been a customer of ours for four or for a few months. Um, after the first month, Thrive became his number one selling probiotic, 
and by the third month it became his number one selling product in the store. So he saw success very quickly with Thrive. Dave really took the time to learn the science behind Thrive like you are all doing today and he shared this knowledge with his customers. And you know, these are obviously customers who are coming back to buy more every month. You know, people that are talking to other people in the community because it's been effective for them. Um, and Thrive has been making his customers healthy and it's also making his store a bit more profitable. So um, I also believe part of the reason um, for the success in these stores is because they're not only recommending Thrive for digestive issues, but for a wide range of other conditions, um, as Tom had mentioned. Um, our focus has really been on um, independent health food stores rather than the big chain health food space. Uh, the independent stores really seem to be able to communicate this message to their customers and they really seem to do well with Thrive. So we're really excited to get Thrive into the hands of your customers and we really want you to try this because we know that you guys will be a customer for life.